You found the number one internet site for irreverent, cool, and entertaining talk programming. It's LA Talk Radio. We say what we want. Now, broadcasting from, from the city of angels. angels. Los Angeles. Oh. You're listening to the Sheena Metal Experience with your host, Sheena Metal, only on LA Talk Radio. That's right, it's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on LA Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com, sheenamedalexperience.com. Don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show and to call and talk to us live. It's 818-602-4929. That's 818-602-4929. My guests all this hour are also involved in the Young Playwrights Festival with a show that is happening this weekend. One of my guests returning to Sheena Metal Experience, the wonderful actress Taya Gill, who it's always so great to have here. Hi, Taya. Hi, Sheena. Lovely to be here again. And, of course, with her, uh, one of her uh, her co-stars on in this play, Nathan Frizzell, and the director Warren Davis are with us as well. What is the title of your show, guys? Uh, I said Jesus. <laughs> I see Jesus. I, it, you know that's the way it sounds, but uh, it's actually a word. Uh, e i s e g. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Am I, am I right? G e s i s. And what does it mean? I see Jesus. Um, I, I'm very bad at explaining uh, this, but it's the. Oh, you want to do it? Well, it's just, right. uh, the term is it. I think it was on Wikipedia. <laughs> it was just the the misinterpretation of of a text, especially when it refers to the Bible. Oh. In such a way that it it actually starts to become the meaning the meaning of the phrase or the 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 concept uh so so you know basically you misunderstand something and then suddenly that miss the misunderstanding uh, yeah, becomes starts the reality the meaning. Yeah. so it's like biblical urban slang right <laughs> kind of, in yeah. a way where you begin to believe it's the truth from the bible because you think yeah. it is mm-hmm. wow it's not an eye disorder where a deity appears no. <laughs> i see no. jesus Okay, just check it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Warren, you go first, because I know we had Scott Lowell in the last hour, and he mentioned how terrific you were. You've been involved Aww. with Young Playwrights Festival for a while. I have. You know, I'm, uh, I, I think I've lost count. I've I been going on, this is my maybe 13th year. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, I started out uh, as an actor, so for the first uh, three years, I was an actor in the festival, and then uh, the uh, producer of the festival who, at the time, Christopher Steele, um, uh, asked me to associate produce, so there was one year that I associate produced. Uh, the year after that, I started directing, and I think that was 2002, which would make this my 10th anniversary as a, a director. That's wow. fantastic. Well, my t- it would be my 10th time directing in the festival, yeah. I'm very proud of it, and I uh, I tell people uh, that it's, it's somewhat sad, but uh, it's one of the highlights of my year. I just look forward to it so much, um, <laughs> because it is an amazing experience to see... Uh, the looks on these kids' faces. These are kids from all over the country who submit their scripts, and um, you know, you know, they're in. Maybe it was read in their high school or something, and then uh, suddenly it's accepted into this festival, and they're on a plane to California, and they see people that they're familiar with from TV or movies saying their words on stage. Fantastic! It's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable experience. It's it's like something you should have to win a game show to get. (laughs) I mean, really, it's like a a once-in-a-lifetime, probably the first time they're ever going to have something like that happen in their careers. That's a beautiful thing. Well, we hope not. I mean, we hope that some of them uh, stick with writing, and and it's a very uh, inspirational um, experience, and... We hope, and some of them have gone on to right. to success. But I mean, this is probably their yeah. first, their first yeah. big thing as a playwright mm-hmm. that's really happened. And it's it, it's twenty and younger, uh, nineteen and younger, nineteen so, and younger. Uh, and the I think the the youngest winner was thirteen. I might be speaking out of turn here. I know we had wow. a thirteen year old. Uh, I don't. I think we've had uh, entrants from kids younger than thirteen, but I, I I'm not sure if any of them have won. Um, we had one kid who won every year from thir- age 13 to age 19. Wow. wow. Yeah, phenomenal. I got to direct one of his pieces and it was a blast. Yeah. So for you, is it fun as a director because it's it's kind of an accelerated thing where you're rehearsing just a few <clears throat> handful of rehearsals and then going right up doing a, a little crop of shows and then you're done. So it's, That is exactly right. And these guys be will quick tell you fantastic. just how accelerated it is. <laughs> so, now, Taya has never done this before. She's not been through this process. Um, maybe she can, you know, elaborate yeah. uh, if she wants to on uh, how accelerated it is. But it, it really is, it's very, very fast. We had seven, eight rehearsals. So. Taya, how did you get involved and what drew you to this particular project? 
Well, I, 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 I'm actually a, re a replacement. <laughs> I, I came in, uh, and, and so was uh, Nathan. Um, we came in at the last minute, uh, mm. and so it was just offered to me from the casting director, Scott David, and I, you know, I'm really thrilled to be part of it. Uh, it's, um, it, it is a very, uh, you know, very fast, very quick rehearsal process, but of course we're um, fortunate to be in the hands of such a master director. Oh. Oh. Stop. Why? Stop. No, I'm, I'm but that's half the fun, right? As actors, it's fun to be in an accelerated thing. Okay, yeah. now, here we go. Memorize it. Act your ass off. Now go on stage, and now we're done. I mean, that's how fun is that? It's go, it's go time. Yeah. That's basically what it is. It's the adrenaline rush, and whether yeah. we want to admit it or not, we all love the adrenaline rush, and that's part of why we do this. Yeah. Because it's fun. Yeah. And it and um, you know the thing is you get to you get to grow in it because you only have like four performances, so you know you you start and uh, you know, the the, <laughs> the normal life cycle of a play is by the time you know six weeks eight weeks if that's the you know length of a normal run, uh, you know it's very bittersweet. You're feeling like okay, I kind of got it. I got what I wanted out of it. I did what I wanted with the role, and you miss everybody. But it's time to move on. But this show it closes, and you're like okay, I'm just ready to get going. <laughs> that's fantastic. But and and was that kind of the fun that it was something that you could pop in and do quickly? Yeah, sure. Uh, you don't really have a lot of time to think about it. You sort of have to do the work on your feet, uh, very uh, impulsively, very uh, 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 spontaneously. And so there's um, a benefit to that. You know, you don't have a lot of time to uh, worry and plot and, <laughs> you know, stage too much. You, you kind of have to just sort of go with the flow. See, Nathan, you're an adrenaline junkie like me because I can tell every time she says a word like not time or you just have to go, you're like jumping up and down excited. <laughs> it's true. And I'm the same way. I'm like, oh, fun, 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 four rehearsals or whatever, you know, but a lot of actors that makes them uncomfortable because a lot of actors really want their seven weeks to kind of go through their thing mm -hmm. and get familiar and then they want their six week run to kind of ramp into it and change it throughout the performances. You know, they'll say, don't come see me till week four because <laughs> they're planning to ramp through. But to me, acting is about okay here it is memorize it in five minutes we're doing it go and that's exciting well it's very much like I grew up playing a lot of sports and I, I, I still right. play tennis all the time and I, I teach a little bit too as well but um, you know at a certain point you, you, you have to stop practicing and you have to actually play the game right. and that's very much what this festival experience has been is we have a week and a half it's a 35 30 to 35 minute show I, I'm personally on stage the entire time and I've, it's about 30 pages of dialogue and you know it's a daunting task when you look at the page and almost the entire script is highlighted. You know, you've got it. I just I was showing a friend of mine and he was like, You have to say all that and it's true, I do, but you know what? I had no choice but to just learn it and do it and, and you gotta see the forest for the trees and just go for it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and Taya just did the vagina monologues for me. And it's, you know, we don't rehearse. It's the same thing. It's actually in the guidelines that you can't rehearse more than twice. So I think, mm. well, if you can't rehearse more than twice, then I shouldn't rehearse anybody at all. And we basically just did, you know, a read through and before the show for blocking. And that was it. Yeah. And to me, that's it's amazing to see what an actor can come up with and do without having to have weeks of rehearsal and just to kind of fly into it. And that, but I do live radio for a living, so that mm -hmm. accelerated pace for me is a very kind of exciting thing. And, and if I could just jump in, talking about uh, accelerated pace, uh, the Blank also does a program called the Living Room Series, which they don't do in June. It usually runs from September to uh, May. Um, I produced that series for about six years, um, so I know it intimately. And, and it's uh, basically a new play reading every week. Mm -hmm. Um, Wonderful, and the, that's also a situation where you really don't rehearse a lot. You know, you 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 get the script, you do a read through. It's called the living room series because the, the, when it origin Daniel Henning originated it, uh, people would sit in the living room in somebody's living room and read these plays. Wonderful, and so you know the idea is you know you just you just get as few rehearsals as possible, put it on its feet. It's a fully staged reading. It's not a reading where people are sitting. So when the audience comes on Monday night to see it, it's staged with. Um, as little tech as possible, but you you know there are lights, there are sound, um, costumes if necessary. But uh, uh, so I kind of cut my teeth uh, directing by directing these readings, and uh, it's yeah, it's definitely that even more so than the Young Playwrights Festival, if you can believe that. It's it's kind of like jump in with feet first and uh, and don't be timid. And isn't that amazing what you can get out of something like that? That it, people can really get the full essence of a play from listening to people sit around a circle and read. Yeah, and and in the living room series, you you get the full essence of a play without the, you know without people just sitting. You it's fully staged. 
There's wow. no yeah. That's the, the goal of the Living Room series is that no one is necessary to read stage directions because it is staged to the point where it's just not necessary. But people are reading. People, oh, are, you, people are holding their scripts. So they are holding their scripts. Yeah. It's and, amazing. And that's the, the other thing that's amazing is that the audience forgets that after a while. Yes. You know, when, when you are actually present as an actor and you are performing, the audience, it's almost like those scripts disappear. People don't even notice them anymore. It's really an amazing thing when it works, and, uh, and it frequently works. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. So well, let's get a little background on everybody. Warren, where do you come from uh, background-wise as an actor? And you know, when did you know that you wanted to do this and stay in this wacky business for life? <laughs> I uh, Obviously, uh, there's something wrong with me. Uh, because I, I'm still, <laughs> With us uh, all, my friend. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I actually grew up in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I had no uh, connection to acting or the arts in any way. Um, I was interested in filmmaking when I was a teenager. I was one of those guys making those crazy little uh, Super 8 monster movies. Mm. Um, but I had no desire to be an actor, really. And um, I was fascinated with computers. And when I went to college, my two choices were either filmmaking or computers. And uh, everybody kind of steered me towards computers, thinking that that was a, a real person's job. And uh, right. no, no one ever steers you towards acting, <clears throat> right. ever. Is that, well, acting wasn't the choice. It was filmmaking. Oh, but, no one steers you towards that No, either. exactly. But uh, I, I don't regret it. I, uh, I actually started my career doing video games. So back in the uh, mm -hmm. mid-'80s, the days of, uh, or the early-'80s, actually, is when I started with arcade games were fairly new. I was making video arcade games in Chicago. And... Um, uh, acting was just something I did. I started in college on a lark, and I never really took it seriously. And uh, in Chicago, I, I, I started out doing improv at Second City, and uh, I, again, I never thought of myself as a real actor. But I kind of got tired of the improv thing. I, I, everybody was trying to be funnier than the next guy, and that kind of got boring. And I took a real acting class and started doing plays, and everybody around me started working in bigger and bigger theaters, and suddenly I was an actor. I don't even know how it happened, really. Wow. Chicago's a good theater town, though. It's a it, it, good it theater scene. It is a great scene. theater town. It was really, it was a golden age of theater in Chicago at the time. I'm one of those people that believes that Los Angeles is becoming an amazing Absolutely. theater town right I'm now. Absolutely. I'm one of those people, too. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but nobody realizes it in the rest of the country yet, but mm -hmm. they will. There's going to be a time where people are going to go, wow, Los Angeles has become a vibrant theater uh, This town. is the time to be in L.A. in the theater. Because mm -hmm. it's really, you know, they say something like 70-something uh, new plays a year here. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. And there's hundreds of little theaters doing all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. And writers, too. You know, um, I just uh, closed the Chinese Massacre Annotated, which was uh, Circle X did that. I was an actor in it. We closed a few weeks ago. That was written by Tom Jacobson, who's a guy who's had like something like 70 plays produced uh, here in L.A. Uh, just an amazing wow. uh, talent, yeah. And did you do that at the new Atwater Village Theater? I did indeed, yes. At Gates Theater. That's, That's right. It's wonderful. Uh -huh. Gates McFadden, who's been on the show, she she runs that theater, and she's wonderful. Yeah, well, it's, they actually share. It's, they uh, share, right. Ensemble For, Studio Theater, and right. uh, which is Gates Theater, and Circle X. Right, uh, share which, that theater space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to do something there, because that's an amazing great, theater yeah, space. Yeah, I had a great time. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Um, do you still love acting? I mean, as much as I directing? Do. Or is directing kind of your heart now? Uh, I, I love both, and I, I really couldn't see leaving one for the other. So it's very nice that I get the opportunity to do both, you know. Well, um, and he's a very talented sound designer as well. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So do you yeah, consider, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing sound design, if you're doing acting, directing, producing, as long as you're working in the creative arts, mm -hmm. it's all good? Yeah. I, I, you know, I've... Uh, again, something wrong with me. I, I've never had a very direct career path. I just like, I, I guess I'm selfish. I just like to enjoy what I'm doing. So I think it's great. Um, I tend to, to just try to do things that I enjoy. Don't you think that we as creative people kind of fall into that, uh, sometimes we, we, we start to believe the myth that we have to be one thing. Are you an actor? Are you a writer? Are you a director or a producer? I think anything that's creative that floats your boat, if you want to do a TV show all day, go home and paint and have a gallery opening that weekend, to me, as creative people, I think we're always up for anything that's creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's good to be versatile, you know. Uh, I, I have this story that I tell where one of my first real big auditions in Chicago for a film, it was like for a feature film in Chicago, which there aren't that many, or certainly weren't back in the day. Um, and the casting director, who was one of the big casting directors in Chicago, you know, it was my first meeting with him, and he said, so uh, what, what kind of an actor are you? And I didn't really understand the question. I Later, I figured out he wanted to know, am I a comedic actor or am I a dramatic actor? I didn't know that at the time. I said versatile. <laughs> yeah. and, and, One and, who and, likes and, to work. Well, and here's the punchline me. of the story. He laughed at me. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it was just kind of, it was kind of a you know an eye opening thing. People want to pigeonhole you in some yeah. way. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, Nathan, how about you? What's your background? Obviously, your background is the creative arts and and athletics at the same time. Right. Well, that's it's funny actually. I I grew up in New Orleans, and uh, New Orleans is actually a very I mean, it's still a southern city. Sports is very big, obviously, just as it is in the rest of the South. But um, we, uh, I, I grew up doing theater. I started when I was seven. And uh, I kept kind of switching back and forth between sports and theater growing up. But then when I got to college, Louisiana State University actually has a, a surprisingly good theater program. And I just sort of decided, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go for it. This is what I want to do anyway. I don't like any of the other choices that I have on my plate. Um, so I just went for it, and I moved out to Los Angeles, and uh, I, you know, I work commercially, I work on television, uh, features here and there, but I actually stick really close to home, because like Warren said, I think Los Angeles is becoming a really great theater I town. Um, I got involved with The Blank through uh, a, a, a fellow I've, direct, uh, I've been directed by on a number of occasions, his name is Michael Matthews. He's also a Chicago guy. And, uh, Who I've done sound design for a couple of times. Now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I just associate produced the last show at the Blank called The Temperamentals. And Wonderful. Yeah, and that's how I and that's my first foray into production and to producing. And it's I really enjoy it because even though I'm not on stage, I'm still helping to tell a story. And that's what I think a lot of us in the theater and that are actors or writers or directors. That's what we like to do is we tell stories. We're storytellers. I agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no matter what in what capacity that may be. Yeah. So um, I, that's and then I found myself doing. I'd been wanting to get involved with the blank for a while. I'd, I'd I've seen a number of productions. They always do really good work, and uh, so I feel very fortunate to be a part of the the festival. So this has been a great show, and I'm really looking forward to it opening. I saw my first show in the fall at the Blank. I saw Tara Haute with Mike Farrell and mm-hmm. Jim Perrick, and they were both on the show. And then Mike had been on the show a couple of times before. I did the sound design. Did you really? <laughs> it was brilliant. I, I was so impressed with just everything about the Blank. Mm. And and I think that's all. another thing that's really making the L.A. theater scene so vibrant right now is all of these beautiful theater ensembles and repertory companies that are coming up and doing brilliant work, you know, creative minds coming together to do wonderful things. And, uh, and and I think that it rivals anything that's going on anywhere right now. And it's funny because a few years ago, they flew me out to Manhattan. It was the first time I did the vagina monologues. And there were only two of us from L.A. And I thought it was going to be, you know, oh, here come the L.A. people. <laughs> you know, hi, are you on Baywatch? <laughs> and I was amazed at the outpouring from a lot of these actresses that do a lot of off-Broadway and a lot of Law & Order saying, God, I wish I lived in L.A. because there's so much more theater there. Mm, because in New York, snow. if you're not on Broadway, that's true. If you're not on Broadway, which is very corporate, and there's not as much off Broadway anymore. So mm-hmm. mostly you're in Connecticut, you're in Jersey, you're upstate doing things, and you're not really in Manhattan anymore. Mm-hmm. Here you can be five minutes from a Hollywood studio and there's 12 theaters on a row. Or you can be in NoHo and there's 15 theaters in a row. Mm-hmm. So I think just because of the way LA is laid out, we have so many more theaters. And then yeah. the, the quality is getting better. I, I've right. always said, uh, uh, since I moved here, there's, there's such a fine line. Uh, between really, really great theater, I mean, theater that will rival anything I've ever seen, and then really scratch your eyes out, pull your hair out kind of theater. But that that gap is widening. I think that there's a lot more really quality productions being produced from large theaters to medium theaters to even the smallest, tiny, like, broom closet theaters. I agree. You can just see some great stuff in the city. Well, and I think now that so many people are necessarily not always going to movie theaters that are big, and the home theater thing is so big. People have gotten used now to being in a smaller theater. And people aren't so freaked out anymore if it's not the Pantages or mm-hmm. the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. People are learning to enjoy going to 99-seat or less theaters mm-hmm. and really enjoy what you get from intimate theater that you don't get you know, from a big theater, which is being you know three feet from someone who's mm-hmm. acting their ass off live in front of you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's intense. And, and as somebody who loves the adrenal rush, as Nathan now knows about me, <laughs> uh, as an audience member, that's exhilarating. Mm-hmm. Well, there is like an outpouring of energy and talent coming out of somebody who's two and a half feet from me. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is so cool. Yeah. So. And there's, there's a lot of theater companies in this town that are really raising the bar as far as yes. what, what people can do in, in the 99-seat uh, uh, contract. And um, 
you know, the blank is one of them. I mean, really, over the last 20 years, I think the, they have raised the bar. And, I agree. And they, they've gotten amazing actors and amazing... And, and it, their home space, uh, which is the second stage on the corner of Santa Monica and Wilcox, it's a, it's like a 53-seat theater. It's beautiful. That's but, where I saw Tara Hope. <clears throat> yeah, it is just absolutely amazing how it gets transformed from show to show. Yeah. Uh, you always yeah. just, you know, you just never know what you're going to walk into. And uh, you get completely immersed in in, uh, in whatever that play is. Yeah, it's a perfectly wonderful black box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's fantastic. So, Taya, I don't think I've ever asked you this. How, what made you want to become an actor and get involved in theater? And and how little were you? I mean, was it something that you knew as a very small child? Yeah, I want to grow up and do that. Were you acting when you were a kid? I mean, I don't even think I know your story with that. Oh, uh, pretty pretty common. Um, discovered the joy and the love of stage work on uh, grade five. <laughs> okay. So you were a kid that was saying to your mom, yeah, I want to audition for some stuff or doing junior high plays. Sure. I was uh, saying and played the piano a lot. My mother actually encouraged me to be a, a singer for the chamber choir. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I decided to act uh, and I enjoyed it very much. And uh, I, I continued all throughout junior school and, and element, elementary and senior school and um, wasn't quite sure whether or not that was going to be my choice of profession, but uh, um, took a, a plunge and um, made a choice and dove right in. And I, I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. I, I love what I do, even though it can be very difficult and mm -hmm. challenging at times, lifestyle-wise, personally, media, you know, socially. Uh. See, I love the lifestyle. Maybe I'm just a big old gypsy. <laughs> but I like the fact that I don't have to go to the same place every day. Although, oddly, now I do. I come to the same place every day, <laughs> but only for a couple hours, and I love it. Uh. I love that my life is not the exact same life every week, that there's always new. You're always meeting new people for your tribe. It's always something new and exciting. Mm -hmm. Uh, you get ex you, ma you make the coolest friends in the world, and your life is constantly being challenged with new excitements. And 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 I I love all of that. And you know maybe I was born to be in this business. And Nathan's like, yeah, me too. Well, th I mean I agree with you. But those those are the pluses. You know th there are minuses. You know there's some, you know lack of income. Uh, that's that's <laughs> a minus when you don't work you don't that's get paid. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and and there and, and you know, there's certainly a, a, a price uh, to fame and and being recognizable. Absolutely. You know, so um, you know, it's not all roses, but um, yeah, I do think people are in this business because they are drawn to it, and uh, it's the lifestyle they want to they want to live. Could you do anything else? Because I think a lot of people are in this business, <laughs> right, guys? Because you couldn't really not be in this business. So I mean, could you just say one day, you know, I'm going to be like a real estate broker and just walk away from it forever? I've thought about it, um, but I haven't really answered that question uh, yet. So I don't know, really, to tell you the truth, Sheena. Wow. Yeah, it's hard to it's it's hard to imagine. I've had a, f a few opportunities come my way to kind of lead me away from acting and from the theater and from film and television and so forth, and and it's hard to 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 stare down the road and say, wow. Well, I'd be able to continue doing theater, working in a, uh, working at this job, you know, right. working at becoming normal a tennis ball rep. <laughs> well, actually, not far off from that. Actually, yeah. I actually I actually currently work for a really great player development company that's Wonderful. tennis center. Anyway, I digress. But that's uh, not a normal life either, right? No, working it's not. With professional athletics. That's kind of like show business in its own way. Well, it's it's hard because it's two e extreme passions of mine. I, I love the sport of tennis and I love acting. I and, love tennis too. Right. I mean, it, well, there's a lot of similarities between playing tennis and acting. Absolutely. I mean, it's all that's reactive. Right. I love it's to all watch tennis. Absolutely. Because it's not only about it's not an endurance sport, but it's a thinker sport. Mm, totally. And it's, you have to think three moves ahead. And I think acting is the same way whether you're cold reading in an audition or you're actually on stage you have to always be thinking ahead and thinking about what are the other people on stage doing what is what's what's the audience energy you're always thinking and tennis you can see them thinking sure. as they're having to exert this amazing athletics well there's beats i mean there's beats to yeah, a and it's that point there's too. beats to a game right. and and you know yeah. there's there's love that v so many similarities but so you can see why these opportunities Absolutely. are tempting sure but you know i still uh I, like I said, I look down that road, and I'm just not sure that I could do without acting. You know, for an right. extended period of time, it's it's a release. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, I mean, I, I've actually had a regular job for much of my career, my, much of my life. Uh, you know, in the video game or some somehow in the software world. Um, but uh, I I I don't think I ever could give up 
either because even you know now where I I've, I've sort of on a sabbatical from from uh, you know a regular job or that's going on a year and a half and uh, I'm really enjoying not doing that but even I find myself you know I'll still do software projects in my spare time mm. <laughs> but is working on a video games is that really a real job compared to what a, I mean a real job is like well, I go to the plant house. and the car part comes down the conveyor belt well, yeah. and I stamp the red thing on it and yes it, it is a re- it's a lot of work video games is a lot of work it requires a lot of time it requires a lot of mental uh, you know uh, plate spinning and uh uh, yeah, it, it's it's a very difficult job for a programmer um, to program a video game. Yeah. But it's still a creative job, right? It still makes your mind, it fulfills your mind and your soul. It's not um, like it can. I sit at my desk and I stamp paid, paid. It, it can, it can, but it, it can also be, you know, drudgery. In an and office difficult. with an evil boss. <clears throat> it just depends. Yeah. I mean, I think most people who do that really love doing that yeah you know? i agree you know i used to love doing that uh when i was doing it you know 60 hours a week you know i mean i really love doing it because the because when you do all this work and you sweat and whatever and there's a payoff which again is like theater it's it's not it, you know success doesn't come easy or or satisfaction i should say doesn't come easy well and you get yeah. to look at your finished game and that's like watching your film when it's mm-hmm. done or your television show mm-hmm. you're like i helped to make yeah this very cool thing that people are going to enjoy for the next 20 years that's exactly right that's so exactly I, right. I would think that that is a fulfilling creative art as well. It's just using a little bit of a different part of your brain. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn anything are, into show business. You are wise beyond your years. <laughs> <laughs> she is. I'm old. I just have good genes. This is Sheena Metal Experience, LA Talk Radio. Quick break, and we're right back with you with much more radio fun. It's the Sheena Metal Experience right here on LA Talk Radio. For more info on the show, latalkradio.com, sheenamedalexperience.com. Uh, don't forget to email me and let me know what you think of the show. We're talking about the Young Playwrights Festival all this hour. Amongst things, my guests are wonderfully talented actors, Warren Davis, who's also a director, Nathan Frizzell, and Taya Gill, who are all doing this wonderful show for the Young Playwrights Festival called uh, I See Jesus. <laughs> I See Jesus. I See Jesus. That's I right. See Jesus, yes. I'm just forever going to think I See Jesus every time I say that. As most um, people do. <laughs> Taya, set the show up a little bit. What's it about? Uh, well, it's... um. About a college student um, who uh, solves uh, a theory that uh, transforms mankind and the world. Oh, wow. Uh, yet in the scope and the setting of this particular piece, uh, we start with sort of a f- flashback scenario um, that is uh, presented to him by two beings uh, in a place that is quite uh, dangerous and scary and frightening and gray and dark, who come to him to question and to probe his memory about this theory uh, that he solved and what the effects were on the people that were affected by it. It's it's kind of a, a classic uh, Twilight Zone scenario in say, a way. Wow! It, yeah, you worry about the government coming when you solve a theory, <laughs> but beings from another place is even more evil. Yeah, it's it's um, you know basically you know the guy wakes up and doesn't know where he is or how he got there, and and uh, it, it's a little science fictiony in that he's you know clearly not on Earth, and, and uh, he's in a sort of a strange state that uh, he's not quite certain, and and yeah, and then. Um, and then Taya uh, plays one of the uh, his one of his interrogators. I would call them. Wow! Yeah. People are always making you an alien, Taya. God knows. Is there something about you that just says I'm a, a scary alien from another place, and I've come to probe your brain? I have no idea. Mm. I, would you have any reason? To Too pretty uh, to be yeah. human. You, you can probe it's, my. Oh, that's you can a probe nice my answer. brain anytime. Nathan can oh. stay. <laughs> um, and and so uh, you're and you're the college student. I am. That's, I and am. is it what's fun about it for you, Nathan? Well, it's what you know. It's it's a different role than I've been able to play since I came out to Los Angeles. I mean, I, I find myself playing a lot of the guy next door. Right, kind the of, frat boy. Yeah, kind of comic sure. relief type of roles. And this one is a lot more um, intellectual and there's very much a, a character feel to this guy. But everything is extremely honest. I mean, you wake up in a place and you have no idea where you are. You don't know how you got there. And you're surrounded by two people who seem to have very sinister motives. 
and uh, they won't tell you why you're here, and they just keep probing you for information that you don't remember. And so it's this really, uh, it's a really intense role, yeah, in a really intense show. Actually, there's this wonderful kind of these layers of suspense throughout the whole, and it's only like I said, a thirty thirty five minute show, but it, it does such a great job of just kind of keeping you wondering what what is going on, what's happening in this world, and and that's what is really really stands out to me about this show and it's why I'm like I said I'm excited for it to open it seems from the three shows that I've heard about four shows that I've heard about this year uh, that there's a level of intensity is that the same more in every year that these these I mean for, <clears throat> for considering it, taking the age of the playwright out of it even mm-hmm. if it was written by 50 year olds it's there's a, a level of intensity to each one of these stories mm. that's it, it actually it it's vari- not fluff. It, it, true, it varies yeah. from year to year, and and occasionally the, sh- the stories are fluff. We've had you know plays that are just about you know oh that boy's cute, but they're interesting in some way, and they speak in a certain way that seems you know unique and interesting, and that the playwright's voice is interesting. And so, um, but but it does vary from year to year. I uh, have been on the reading committee in past years. I couldn't do it this year, unfortunately, because of my schedule. But the people who were on the reading committee told me they thought this was a, a really banner year. It was a really great year with a lot of great scripts. Um, but yeah, there there are, there have been scripts in the past that just made you know, I, I just my jaw would drop at the level of complexity. That these kids would wring out of a script. I, I mean, you, you know, fifteen-year-old kids writing this amazing, um, amazing stuff, deep stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's sad. Sometimes it's uh, you know uh, happy. Something. There's a lot. Of, we've had a lot of great comedies in the festival too. It's a. It's always a mixed bag. Do you think that we're? Because I think sometimes that people think, oh, you know, kids, they're they're shallow teenagers. But I think a lot of times, with me, I know I was a lot more intense as a teenager. And I sort of mellowed with age. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that the, the, the ideas that these kids are producing before the whole world comes in and says, well, that's not commercial mm-hmm. enough. Or that's right. You need to write for a more mass audience. And then they kind of whitewash their stuff. And this is the kind of really gritty stuff that you're getting from this creative mind before it's been censored by the industry and they have to worry about well who's going to send me a paycheck and what do I have to write for hire that's exactly right and and you know it might not be the industry that censors them it, it might be you know other people in their communities sure. that just don't get them and the um, agent or you know the the manager mm-hmm. you, you know what you need to do is just you know write a play about people at a prom yeah <laughs> or or you know even maybe the parent or the teacher sure. or it could be any any of those things but you know the the amazing the amazing thing is that these kids, you know, are writing these plays on their own, pouring out their hearts and souls, and then getting this kind of feedback at a very young age, and the, you know, the effect it has on them is just absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. That's wonderful. And are you finding that, that this is some of the, Taya, that this is some of the deepest material, some of the most bizarre material that you've dealt with? Absolutely. And that it's written by a teenager is astounding. Yes, and uh, we should note that the uh, playwright of uh, our play is uh, Nicholas Misakowski. Very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and how old is he? Do we know? He, seventeen. Is he seventeen or? Yeah, he you know, you're right. He's seventeen. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And he's, I think you said he that earlier. In Alabama, born. 1993. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he, they live in Alabama, and I think you know because I met him and his mom, and I think they're just they're kind of overwhelmed because they come from this like small town in Alabama and you know here they are walking through Hollywood uh, the heart of Hollywood it's just it's so surreal for them but that's yeah. the kind of place where aliens would come and abduct you mm. it's always but, the people well, in the rural areas that the aliens come to visit I'd like to see you know what play he writes based on his experiences in Hollywood right yeah, exactly well, and I don't know where I don't know the world that he, he comes from but, but one of the things that, that this play deals with uh, is a sense of, of guilt uh, about the way that my character has changed the world um, and you know I know growing up in the south you know there are certain communities where, where guilt is a big issue sure so I mean I, we were talking to Nicholas the other day and we were just encouraging him you know keep keep on because he's got a, to be able to write it, it, it kind of pose these huge questions at such a young age you know he deals with a lot of interesting issues in this play and mm-hmm. we're just telling him you know, just keep on going you know keep using it you can there's definitely a number of moments in here where you can see he was inspired by and he even said like Stephen King and and I asked him if he'd seen Lost because I feel like there's a lot of elements uh, of the TV show Lost in here and he'd actually never seen an episode which mm-hmm. is impressive to me and it definitely sounds Twilight Zone that kind of a mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got that feel to it, yeah. Do you feel, Nathan, that you artistically can be a lot freer in a place like Los Angeles than you could when you were still in Louisiana? Well, well I New was, Orleans is a big city, so it's, was, it's a little different. I was about to say, I, I feel fortunate enough to have been... New Orleans is a... It's definitely a more liberal city than the rest right. of, of the South. And you're from New Orleans proper, so I'm you're like a city proper. kid. Yes, right. yes. And, you know, it's a very laissez-faire city, too. I mean, sure. it's, you, know, you can kind of get away with a lot, but... Yeah, definitely. I mean, Los Angeles is a place where you can see some of the most wonderfully bizarre stuff. Yeah, you can be yourself. (laughs) Yeah. And And it's funny because people always say, oh, in L.A., you have to be an L.A. person. But I lived in three states before we moved here when I was a teenager. And I think that you can be more who you organically are in L.A., than anywhere in the world. I think that's why you can just be whatever your deal is. You know, you want pink hair or 50 <laughs> piercings or, you know, size G boobs. Okay. Exactly. Well, it's on a, on a more personal <laughs> level as, as an actor, as an artist in general, you can make bolder choices yes. as an actor. I mean, you, you can you don't have to worry about being judged or the consequences of it because people, especially people that come see theater, tend to be more open-minded and, and able to accept these choices that you make. So... Yeah, yeah, it's not I, like, oh, why did you do that play? It's freakish. No. Well, people, oh, I get it. It was a good choice. Yeah. And that's nice. And I think people forget about that, that if you're an artist in a small town, still there's limits. I have a friend who I know from the paranormal community, because I do a paranormal show here, <laughs> and she's a, a ghost hunter. She's also an actor and a director. And she had to clear it. And she lives in a college town, but w- a rural college town. She had to clear it with, with the, the Chamber of Commerce to direct a production of Dracula. Wow. <laughs> because, you know, that's all evil stuff. That actually mm. doesn't surprise me, though. I yeah. Mean, I mean, really? You had to ask permission for Dracula? And that's, to me, that's classic literature. It's not like it's, oh, I'm, okay, I'm going to do hair, but it's going <laughs> to be like a goth version of hair and a goat sacrifice. I mean, it's Dracula. Mm. I went to a Catholic high school in New Orleans, and we did a production. And I still can't believe we got away with doing this. A production of Tommy. Sure. Oh, rock God, I can't believe you got away yeah. with that either. Well, in high school. And, you know, there's... there's all kinds of stuff. Well, in there. then there's there's Uncle Ernie, the, the bet, character yes, who is. molests Tommy. Yes, yeah. And uh, we we definitely and there's the had Acid to. Queen. There's, and there's all Acid kinds Queen. of Catholic things in there. Very you much. You so. could have cleaned that up. You yeah, could have found we a way did. to clean that we up. We did yeah. clean that up. Actually, the Acid Queen became the Gypsy Queen. <laughs> okay. If I'm not mistaken. But even Gypsy <laughs> sometimes. Y- you yeah. No no in some rural areas. Even that, but yeah. Oh, and it, it we you know the funny thing about it was he. The, the director Chase Waits was he really kind of got away with a lot of stuff it was his first play at the school and he got away with an amazing amount of stuff he made some compromises with calling it the Gypsy Queen and they let him get away some, with some other stuff so well done I think on good his for part. you that's awesome <laughs> we did like the man who came to dinner and arsenic and old lace I had yeah. an older theater teacher so we did classics which now I'm glad I did sure but other people were like oh you know we did hair we did Godspell I'm like yeah we did Oklahoma and little Abner <laughs> uh, Warren I'm so excited to come and see the show this weekend let everybody know how they can get tickets and what the dates are well the, uh, we open Thursday night this uh, week um, uh, at 8 p.m. at the Stella Adler Theater on Hollywood Boulevard right by the intersection of Highland uh, just uh, east of Highland um, and uh, you can get tickets by going online to www.theblank.com and there should be a link there to the Young Playwrights Festival or I think you can go directly to www.youngplaywrights.com Wonderful. With a W-R-I-G-H-T I said Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and look for I said Jesus and uh, we're week two of the festival. The festival goes on for the entire month of June and um, Wonderful. every week it's a different program. So from Thursday through Sunday we play Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday we have a matinee at two o'clock. Uh, then next Thursday, it's a whole new slate of shows. It's wonderful. And Warren and Nathan and Taya, will you all come back and see me again? And together, apart, Absolutely. I would love that. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Warren, you first. Where's the best place people can find out about you online? Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I don't think there is a place they can find out about me online. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a little old-fashioned that way. I don't, yeah. I don't, and a I don't have guy. I don't have a uh, you know, self-promotion website. Are you on Facebook? I am on Facebook, but I tend to not. You know, I, my friends on Facebook are actual people I've met. Oh, yeah. Okay, I want to friend you. We'll see if you really like me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nathan, how about you? Uh, Facebook. I am on Facebook, Nathan Frizzell. Also, uh, NathanFrizzell.com will be coming soon nice. within the next couple of weeks. So keep a look out for that. And uh, I also have pages on Actors Access and IMDb.com. Wonderful. And you're at IMDb.com. Yeah, right? I am sure. on IMDb and I'm on yeah. Actors Access as well. And Taya, how about you? I'm on all of those, <laughs> <laughs> too. And, you know, Facebook. And Facebook? Facebook fans. Awesome. Fans. We're not yeah. friends yet, Taya. That's, un- that's not... 
Right. We need to change that. Yeah. You I'm going to add all of you, and then we'll see who and really so, likes yeah. me. Let's see if we're still friends after the show. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so Everybody, good. Everybody, Isa Jesus, make sure to go and see it. The wonderful Taya Gill, Nathan Frizzell, and Warren Davis. If you missed any of the links for how to get a hold of the show or any of them, just go to SheenaMetalExperience.com or LATalkRadio.com, and I'll gladly forward the links over to you. Why? Because I'm Sheena Metal. It's my experience and yours, and you know what we do here. <laughs> Every Monday through Friday, 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we rip the veil off the human sideshow and expose the creatures I like to call big old homo sapiens at their most bizarre and definitely at their most beautiful. And it's true every day on the show. Maybe my show. It is the Sheena Metal Experience after all. That doesn't mean it's not always and forever, undoubtedly and indubitably. And you know what I'm going to say, people. It may be my show, but it's always your experience. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. And I'll see you all tomorrow.